tonight, rail workers ordered back on the job as Canada's Labour Board imposes binding arbitration. The ruling to end job action in Canada's rail sector. We're extremely disappointed. Any federally regulated worker has now lost bargaining power. Trying to put the economy back on track after a bitter contract dispute shut down major railways. We are satisfied that this ends the labor conflict. Stuck in space. Butch and Sonny will return with Crew 9 next February. NASA's new plan for two Starliner astronauts. Pooping cough on the rise. We're certainly having what would be classified as an outbreak. The warning from doctors as kids head back to class. <laughs> Plus, the high-tech film set in the prairies. We're early adopters of this technology, and it's just opening up a whole world of possibilities. The virtual backdrop bringing history to the big screen. CTV National News with Heather Butts. Good evening. A crucial decision tonight from Canada's Labour Board, sending thousands of employees back to work and putting a railway dispute to rest for now. Freight trains must start rolling again first thing Monday morning after a bitter contract dispute shut down the country's two major rail lines. CTV's Jeremy Sharon has more on the binding arbitration and the union's vow to appeal. After three days of uncertainty over railway service across the country, a decision tonight by Canada's Labour Board to impose unprecedented orders requested by Canada's Labour Minister. In a decision issued tonight, the Canada Industrial Relations Board concluded it does not have discretion to vary or to not implement the direction, therefore ordering employees of CN and CPKC return to work Monday, follow the terms of their previous collective agreement until a new one comes into effect, and that both sides move forward with binding arbitration. We're extremely disappointed. They acted on a gutless and cowardly referral by the federal labor minister to break a strike at the first sign of some supply chain disruptions. The union representing more than 9,000 railway employees says it will adhere to the board's ruling, but it plans to appeal the decision in court. Any federally regulated worker now in part who's, who has a job in the supply chain has now lost bargaining power has now lost uh, the ability to, to negotiate higher wages, better working conditions, and to protect what they have. The move ends a work stoppage at CPKC and voids a strike notice issued to CN, where trains had been moving again since Friday. We are satisfied that this ends the labor conflict and that we can get back to our primary focus, something we do every day, which is to power the economy. But today's decision still comes after three days without full service on Canada's railway system, which many industries rely on. We were having huge cash flow uh, problems. You know, basically any money that we thought we had coming is now stopped. In the middle of harvest season, farmers say the disruption already cost their industry tens of millions. The Labour Board says all parties have been directed to meet Thursday to start the arbitration process, but that is only the beginning, Heather. The courts will at some point have a significant decision to make as well. All right, Jeremy, thanks. For more on this, we'll turn to labor relations expert Barry Eidlin. Certainly a lot of people and industries awaiting today's decision, Barry. But there has been criticism over the speed in which the federal government stepped in, sending this to the Labor Relations Board. Absolutely. The government in doing this has gone back on its prior rhetoric of believing in the collective bargaining process and the idea that the best deals are negotiated at the table. Instead, what they've done is essentially give the employers what they want, which sends a concerning message to other employers that they can simply dig in their heels, uh, threaten economic chaos, and have the government intervene. And this has uh, a corrosive effect on the collective bargaining process, while also infringing on Canadian workers' charter-protected rights. Right. And the union says it will appeal the ruling. What will that look like? Well, they're going to have, I mean, we're dealing with charter protected rights, the right to collectively bargain, the right to strike, 
as of 2015, are charter protected rights in Canada. So they can pursue a claim in the court system against the Industrial Relations Board, challenging the constitutionality of their ruling. And Barry, as we've seen this week, a lot of people, a lot of industries reliant on these rail lines right across North America, really. Uh, so it's not really just over right now. This could go on for quite some time, perhaps, or have that uncertainty looming. Absolutely. The pressure of the economic chaos is supposed to be what provides the leverage to get the employer to come to the bargaining table. And by short-circuiting that, by resorting to back-to-work legislation or ruling from the Industrial Relations Board, they're undermining that uh, leverage that is essential for making the entire collective bargaining process work. And in this case, when we're dealing with issues of public safety on the rails, that not just doesn't just have negative consequences for the workers themselves, but for the Canadian public as a whole. Barry Eidlin, thanks very much for your time. Stunning news today from NASA announcing two American astronauts will not be coming home on Boeing's Starliner spacecraft, instead returning to Earth with a rival company next year, meaning the planned eight-day trip is now expected to stretch to eight months. CTV's Christina Tenalia has more. Three, two, one, ignition. A June 5th takeoff that had all the pomp and circumstance of a big mission. A short flight on the Boeing Starliner, set to last eight days. You got a good throttle up. It was a test trip. The necessity of the experiment proven once things went wrong. Today, a resolution with NASA announcing that a flight from Boeing rival SpaceX will bring the crew of two home. NASA has decided that Butch and Sonny will return with Crew 9 next February. The two astronauts were expecting a speedy journey. Instead, they've been stationed in space for close to three months. They're working very hard on the ground to make sure that we uh, will be able to come home before too long. NASA maintains the crew was never stuck or in danger. The test flight by nature is neither safe nor routine. So after a series of glitches and leaks, now a decision to avoid any risk. Our core value is safety. Astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams will continue their work aboard the International Space Station over the next few months. The troubled Boeing Starliner will now return without a crew. I think uh, unanimously we're disappointed not to be able to do that. The disappointment comes with the comfort that this time lives may have been saved. We have had mistakes done in the past. In 2003, the space shuttle Columbia broke apart as it returned to Earth. They knew that some stuff had happened during launch for that flight, and seven people lost their lives. NASA's decision now adds to ongoing disappointment in Boeing's space program, adding to questions about its future. There's going to be a lot of discussion about whether Boeing is dead in the water and that whole mission is just finished. NASA says Boeing is committed to working on the ongoing issues with its Starliner spacecraft. It's set to land in New Mexico sometime in September. Heather. Thanks, Christina. A whooping cough comeback in Canada has doctors on alert with outbreaks in two maritime provinces this week, fueling further concern over the highly contagious illness, the start of the school year. CTV's Colin Kermali explains. A whooping cough outbreak plaguing Prince Edward Island earlier this month has now spread to New Brunswick. A whooping cough will spread quickly if it has enough vulnerable people to infect. Adding to an already overburdened healthcare system. Any number of increase is a concern to us. Causing concern how fast it'll spread, not just across the province, but across the country. One person with pertussis potentially can spread it to 15 people. PEI has seen 11 cases of whooping cough, also known as pertussis, this month. New Brunswick contending with over 140 cases this year. Neighboring Nova Scotia expecting to experience a rise because of interprovincial travelers. And although Quebec hasn't declared an outbreak, it's seen more than 6,000 cases of whooping cough this year, while Ontario has seen more than 400 cases other provinces noting more regional outbreaks. This is a Canadian issue. This is not just a New Brunswick issue. And with a return to school just around the corner, health experts warn the spread is expected to get worse 
before it gets better. You guys ready to go to school? Yes. Front of mind for many parents swinging into the school year. Of course it is a concern for us and all parents, and uh, we're okay taking the vaccine. In New Brunswick, the latest data shows roughly 80% are vaccinated against pertussis. I would expect that we're going to continue to see more cases across the Maritimes and likely outside of the area as well. Doctors warn the disease mainly affects children and seniors and could be deadly. Most infants receive five doses before they hit the age of two, but require a booster a few years later. If the family doctor, you know, says uh, we have to get it, then eventually we will. Pushing it as the only way to stop the spread. Kamal Karamali, CTV News, Toronto. Blue and yellow flags are on full display across the country as people here mark Ukrainian Independence Day. I want you to know that all of us here in New Brunswick and Greater Moncton, right across Canada, we're all behind you. We all are supporting you. People gathered in Moncton, New Brunswick to honor the 33rd anniversary of the country's independence. Events happen nationwide with many newcomers in attendance. There was mixed reaction for what has become both a celebration and time for reflection. CTV's Raheem Ladani has more. Joyful music and bright colors are center stage at Centennial Park in Etobicoke as people from around the GTA celebrate the 33rd Ukrainian Independence Day. Russia never accepted it, continues to terrorize Ukraine. So it's so important for us to come out, show our support, celebrate our unity. This year, there are more than 100 vendors, including Tatiana Brocheva. She owns a museum in Ukraine and has made it her mission to educate others about her homeland. She's embroidered QR codes on this 100-year towel that was gifted by her mother. When you scan in, uh, each QR code, you can see food Ukraine, dance in Ukraine, uh, Google Ukraine, and video Ukraine is my home. Brocheva came to Canada a year ago to escape the ongoing war. Many thanks, uh, Canadian government. I feel uh, very safe here. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau released a statement saying in part, over 1.3 million Ukrainian Canadians call Canada home today, the second largest Ukrainian diaspora in the world. Some have helped our communities succeed for decades and some have come to our country in the past few years, greeted with warmth and kindness from Canadians across the country. Ukraine's history can never be rewritten, its identity can never be erased, and the spirit of the Ukrainian people cannot and shall never be broken. This is the third year Ukraine's independence is being celebrated against the backdrop of Moscow's full-scale invasion. These doors were taken from homes in Kyiv, riddled with bullet holes and shrapnel. While this carnival game lets people hit a cardboard cutout of Russian President Vladimir Putin. More than 30,000 people attended last year's festival, which organizers say is important to carry on with life, while not forgetting the ongoing struggle. Supporting, obviously, Ukraine and its fight for freedom as much as possible, but at the same time, celebrating everything that we have and having all, all the richness of our culture. And that culture will continue to be on display with entertainment planned until 11 Saturday night. Raheem Ladani, CTV News, Toronto. Overseas, the current conflict top of mind as Russia and Ukraine exchanged hundreds of prisoners of war. <laughs> Liberated Ukrainian soldiers sang their national anthem. Both countries each returned 115 prisoners. Many of the Ukrainian soldiers were imprisoned in the first months of Russia's invasion. Russia's servicemen were captured in the Kursk region, where Ukraine recently launched a surprise offensive. This is the first such exchange since that attack earlier this month. In the Middle East, at least 69 people were killed in multiple Israeli airstrikes, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. The barrage of attacks came amid forced evacuation orders by the Israeli army for an area in central Gaza. More than 100,000 people have fled the city over the past two days. The strikes come as ceasefire talks continue over the weekend in Cairo. 
The Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for yesterday's deadly stabbing rampage at a festival in Germany that killed three people and injured eight others. The man suspected of carrying out the attack has been arrested after a day-long manhunt. Authorities are investigating this as a possible terrorist incident. Two others have also been arrested, including a 15-year-old boy suspected of knowing about the planned attack and not telling authorities. Coming up, less is more. Being intentional with what you buy and making sure to buy less. The new trend making consuming less cool. Glass bringing pro ball to Atlantic Canada. As Canadians struggle with the cost of living, it may not come as a surprise there's a new social media trend aimed at consuming less. Here's CTV's Denise Roberts on the influencers who are finding an audience by showing off skills and ideas to help people cut back. Montrealer Christine Lan isn't your typical influencer. She's not about selling a luxe lifestyle. If anything, she's trying to get people to consume less. Underconsumption is being intentional with what you buy and making sure to buy less. So my account already started as underconsumption, and when the trend took off, I just shared like what I do in my house, and my parents are the true underconsumption people. <laughs> so I grew up like that. Lan makes her own makeup and shares tips on how to give any item a second life like turning scraps into scrunchies. I try to DIY everything that I can at least once in order to help reduce waste and giving me empower me to be able to learn how to make my own stuff. And she's not the only one. Videos with the hashtag underconsumptioncore are spreading across social media. It's a confluence of several trends, according to University of Montreal professor Marcelo Napomoceno. It's basically yeah. people saying, no, I don't want to go through this materialistic uh, society anymore. I want to reject that. I want to have a different lifestyle. As someone who studies consumer decision making, he says there are several motivations. Whether it's to save the planet or just save money for an early retirement, he says people are catching up with the research that shows you can't buy happiness. By actually resisting consum consumption and consum consuming the least and buying the least possible, that's when you're actually going actually to be happier because you're going to be less dependent financially, you're going to be more financial freedom, and you're going to be able to, to follow your hobbies and things that actually give you passion and happiness in life. Underconsumption doesn't mean buying nothing. For Christine Lan, it means being conscious of what you buy and why. So appreciating what you have and getting things that are high quality that you can keep for a long time. Making more out of less. Denise Roberts, CTV News. Still ahead, Indigenous artists shining the spotlight on a new type of film set. A first for Indigenous Canadian independent films now shining in the spotlight. Filming is underway in Regina with movie makers embracing cutting edge technology, shooting entirely on a virtual set. CTV's Alison Bamford reports. It's nighttime in this virtual world, Saskatchewan's back roads, the setting illuminated on the digital canvas. That yeah, looks great. For us it's exciting because we're early adopters of this technology and we get to test the boundaries of it and see what's possible. Van Life, a horror thriller, is just the second film to be shot in front of this LED volume wall in Regina, one of the biggest in the country. Thousands of panels can transport the set anywhere at any time. It speeds up production. If I want nighttime, I don't have to wait till one in the morning when it finally gets dark. This advanced technology is helping tell the story of an age-old struggle. The underlying theme looks at the Métis identity and straddling two cultures. That was a big part of the process when I wrote this, this idea of... of feeling landless, even if you, you know, are from somewhere, but just that feeling. Trevor Cameron is a Métis writer and director. The majority of the cast members are Indigenous, making the production one of the first Indigenous Canadian independent films shot entirely on the virtual backdrop. It's just opening up a whole world of possibilities, not just in Saskatchewan, but I think over the course of the next five to ten years, you're going to see it become more and more common. 
Already a common tool in big productions, there's hope in the industry that these lights can bring the action to the independent film scene. Allison Bamford, CTV News, Regina. In other entertainment news, Baby Biebs has arrived, and the new bundle of joy is also keeping up a family tradition. Baby, 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 oh. The music superstar shared this sentiment on social media. Welcome home, Jack Blues Bieber, along with a precious photo of his baby boy's foot. As Justin and Haley Bieber welcome their first child with the initial JB, the tradition continues on Justin's side of the family. The singer also has the same initials as his dad. Another Canadian is hitting all the right notes and has been crowned air guitar world champion. No instrument, no problem for Canada's Zachary Ichabod fame Knowles, who rocked out his rendition of Nickelback's classic song, Photograph, claimed the win at the annual Air Guitar World Championships in Finland. Well, from singers to sports stars after the break. New hope for hoops in Atlantic Canada. The Basketball League, known as TBL, is now coming to Canada with new teams in the Maritimes, giving some players a second shot at extending their careers. CTV's Paul Hollingsworth explains. Dave Magley sees room for basketball growth in Canada and the U.S. That's why eight years ago Magley helped launch the Basketball League. And now we have 40 teams in North America, including two in Atlantic Canada. St. John and Halifax are new teams. Magley says players earn modest salaries. Instead of playing in the 10,000-seat Halifax Scotiabank Centre, Halifax's team, the Hoopers, hope to play at a smaller university facility. Well, eventually, our goal is to be in the Scotia Bank Center, but we want to be able to fill it out first. TBL teams play close to 30 games. Halifax plans to build its franchise with homegrown talent. We're looking to only have local players. We want to win with local players. Former Canadian national basketball team player Dwight Walton says the league gives players a chance to extend their careers. It's a league of hope. It's a league of second chances. It's also another example of a professional league that has popped up in North America in recent years in multiple sports. University basketball head coach Rick Plato is cautiously optimistic the TBL could succeed in Canada. It just makes not just parents but young people aware that their career is not going to be finished once university's done. Jaden Parker is already considering a post-graduation pro basketball career. Well, when I'm done and my five years are up, I'm not just going to lose my love for basketball. And I think, you know, having an option like this is it's, it's a big deal. The newest TBL teams in Halifax and St. John will begin play in March 2025. Paul Hollingsworth, CTV News, Halifax. That is our newscast for this Saturday night. I'm Heather Butts. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Good night, and I'll see you again tomorrow.